want you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians tonight. Something the Lord showed me when I was young, and I've never been able to fully realize so far in my life or in my ministry, is God is not about traditions. God is not about doctrines. God is not about denominations. God, God is about life. Life in his spirit. Life lived in the liberty and the freedom that comes as a child of God. I thought when I first started out as a teenager and as a young man that the most important thing that I could do in ministry would be to get everybody to agree with my doctrine. That I had grown up in a church that and if somebody had asked me, you know, why are you in the church you're in or why are you in the denomination you're in? You got credentials as a minister and why are you in this church? My I am. But we can experience the personal guidance and fellowship and direction of the Holy Spirit for ourselves in our everyday lives. That is the most precious gift that we have in the new covenant. It is that gift, it is that ability to be led by the Holy Spirit personally. To have that personal relationship with God the Father and with the God the Son and God the Holy Ghost where the Holy Spirit actually comes down from heaven and lives inside us. He just doesn't fall on us once in a while. You know, I always, you know, you always hear, hear the old time saints will say, "Oh, their glory really came down tonight," you know, or, or we're waiting for the glory to fall," you know, or, or we're we're waiting for the Holy Ghost to fall. Friend, the Holy Ghost doesn't have a balance problem. He isn't subject to the laws of gravity, and he doesn't fall. He moves. Hallelujah. It's not that every time we have church, you know, we're calling off to, to God somewhere up there behind the clouds somewhere and begging him to come on down to where we are. I mean, I know we like that song, send it on down, send it on down. Lord, let the Holy Ghost come on down. But really, we shouldn't sing that song because he's already here. He's already come down and he hasn't gone back up. He's not going to go back up until he takes us with him, but at the time he's coming up, we're going to be seeing Jesus come down. Hallelujah. And so shall we meet the Lord in the air. The Holy Spirit is here to stay, but not just to be some kind of nebulous cloud or some kind of unseen force that just kind of bumps you in the night. You ever seen those horror movies where people are getting hit by the ghosts and things and they can't see the ghost and the ghost will come out and whop them and they'll go across the room or something like that and they don't know what hit them, you know? That's not how the Holy Spirit moves. Jesus said that the Holy Spirit will be in you and that the Spirit will flow out of you like rivers of living water. Really, instead of singing, send him on down, we should be singing, send him on out. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jesus said in John 7, 37 to 39, he says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And out of his belly, out of his innermost being, shall flow rivers of living water. And John went on to explain what that scripture meant. He said this, he spoke about the Holy Spirit who was to come upon the disciples. The Holy Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But after he went to the cross and after he rose from the dead and after he ascended into heaven, he was glorified. He was exalted to the right hand of God and then he poured out the Holy Spirit upon the believers. And from that point on, everyone who called upon the name of the Lord could be saved, but not only could they be saved, they could be filled. Oh, that's so exciting. The biggest thing that Jesus had a problem with was the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, the leaders of the Jewish people, because they had taken the revelation of God, they had taken the word of God, and they had held on to it tightly as if it was their own personal possession, and they had a pecking order, and they had a system that would only let certain people that met their requirements and, and met their conditions could come into their little group. 
Jesus said, you have taken away the key of knowledge. You have shut the floor. You have slammed the door to the kingdom of heaven in men's faces. Someone had a desire in their heart to get closer to God and to know God better, and they'd come to one of the Pharisees or the scribes of Jesus' the law. They said, tell me about the Lord. Maybe they didn't smell right. Maybe they didn't look right. Maybe they're the wrong color. Maybe the wrong social status. Maybe the wrong economic status. And that scribe would shut the door in their face. One time the Pharisees said it like this, Jesus healed a man who was born blind from birth. And they asked him, what do you say about Jesus? He's one that healed you. He says, I don't know, he says, whether he's a prophet or not, but this thing I know, I was blind, but now I see. And those scribes and Pharisees and teachers of the law said, well, we know who Moses is. We don't know who this Jesus is. And this mob that knows nothing of the law, there's a curse on them. So what they had was a little system where they were the only ones that got in. And only the people they approved of and the people that they wanted got in. But Jesus said, Behold, in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. And anyone who wants to get in, anyone who wants to be filled, anyone who wants to be led by the Spirit, anyone who wants to have the companionship of the Holy Ghost can come and drink from the river of the water of life and they can be filled with the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will flow out of them day by day. Oh, that's the blessing we have tonight, church. We are people who can have the Holy Spirit live inside of us and lead us and guide us. Why is that so precious? Why is that so special? Because in ages past, men have always been in bondage to one of two things or both. They've either been in bondage to sin or they've been in bondage to other men. And Jesus came to set us free from slavery to sin and he came to set us free from slavery to men. Whether they be religious men, whether they be businessmen, whether they be congressmen, whether they be politicians or government men, God has come to set us free. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The source of your freedom is the Holy Ghost inside of you. When you have the Holy Ghost inside of you, you can stand against a man who calls himself Caesar and who says, you must bow before me and say that I am God. That's what the first century Christians did. All you got to do is burn a little incense to Caesar and just acknowledge that he's a God right along with your Jesus. You see, that's going to be the deception in the last days. That's going to be the temptation in the last days is the idea that we can have somebody alongside of Jesus and we can show worship and we can show obeisance and we can bow before them and acknowledge them as well as Jesus. But what's that first commandment? Thou shalt have no other gods before me or beside me. Oh, that's what the society of this world wants to do. It wants to say, hey, go ahead, have your church. Go ahead, have your religion. Go ahead, have your faith. But at the same time, you bow to this God of economics. You bow to this God of the, of the, uh, the economy. You bow to this God of the corporate culture. You bow to this God of the public school system. You bow to this God of the government. No, we only bow to one, the one who loved us and gave himself for us, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of the living God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. That's what this covenant is all about. And Jesus knows all about you. He knows all about your bad habits. He knows all about your temper. He knows all about your bad language. He knows all about your lust. He knows all about your anger. He knows all about your drinking or your drugs or whatever. He knows all about that. But he loves you anyway. And he says, I will set you free from that and I will make you clean and I will make you my child and you will be able to walk in fellowship in union with me. And I'll speak to you and you can hear my voice and I will follow you and I will never, ever leave you or forsake you. 
That's more precious than any doctrine. That's more precious than, than any denomination. That's more precious than any single experience. Whether it's a working of miracles or a gift of healing or tongues, interpretation, prophecy, you name it. Because after that time is over, after that service is gone, after that manifestation is passed, you still have the one who created the universe living right inside of you. You know, it's possible that an entire church could turn apostate and turn away from God, and there could be one person left that is still going to remain true to Jesus. And what matters isn't that what the other people think. What matters isn't what the crowd's doing. What matters is I know that I am his and he is mine. And I will not bow. I might burn, but I won't bow. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's the most precious thing we have tonight is the ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues right now. I'm not talking about word of wisdom or knowledge. I'm talking about prophecy. I'm not talking about gifts of healing. I'm not talking about any of those manifestations. Because I don't just want the manifestation of the Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want His Spirit. I want His, His fruit. I want His love. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. Bless your name, Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm going to start back here in verse 12 because this leads into something very important. There are many covenants that God has made with mankind throughout time. The first covenant he made with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Adam broke that covenant and we live with the results of it today. All the sin, all the suffering, all the death, all the sickness, all the pain, all the bitterness, all the disappointment, all of that is a result of that broken covenant between Adam and God. God made a covenant with Noah. The scripture said that everybody on earth had corrupted their ways, that God looked down upon the hearts of men and it was only evil continually. Now you see, the thing is, we've not quite reached that in this time. It's not, I mean, you, you look even at people who don't claim to know the Lord, people who serve other religions, there's, there's sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad. Maybe most of the time they're bad. Some people, most of the time they're good. But at least there's some good and some bad. There's be, they're, they're both. But in the time of Noah, the scripture says that every inclination of the heart of men was only evil continually. Now that's pretty bad. I mean, when, it, when it's not sometimes good, sometimes bad, but only evil continually. And that is why it says God was grieved that he made man on the earth. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God made a covenant with Noah. Why is that important to us? Why is that covenant with Noah important to us? Because Jesus said that in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. You think about that. Go back and study about the days of Noah, right before the flood. What the, what the circumstances and what the situation was on the earth. That's exactly what he's going to be on this earth before Jesus comes back. As it was in the days of Noah. Then God went on and made that covenant with Abraham that we've talked about. And promised that through his seed all nations would be blessed. And what I've been trying to get these last few weeks to you to understand is that seed was talking about one person, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the promised seed of Abraham. And we are the heirs of that promise. We are the heirs of that covenant. We share in it. Jesus is our elder brother. And we're members of the same family with him. Praise the name of the Lord. God went on later and made a covenant with King David to establish the line through which Jesus would come to earth. King David was chosen out of all the families of Israel, of all the kings of Israel, that through his line, the promised Messiah would come. God made that covenant with Moses. And that's the one I want to talk a little bit about tonight. Because of all the covenants God made with all the people he made them with, the covenant he made with Moses 
is the one that is contrasted the most frequently in Scripture with the new covenant we live under today. I want to say that again because it's important. Out of all the covenants God made with man, the covenant God made with Moses is the one that is contrasted most frequently in Scripture with the covenant we have today. I want to show this to you in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 tonight. Beginning of verse 12, this is Paul talking to the Corinthians. He says, Now when I went to Troas, which was a city, to preach the gospel of Christ, and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. That's a word for you tonight. No matter where you may walk, no matter where you may go, no matter where God may lead you, if you are his child, if you're submitted to his will, if you're obedient to his spirit, he will always lead you in triumphal procession. Now, does that mean you never have to face negative circumstances? No, it doesn't mean that. But how many of you know that you go through them instead of under them? <laughs> triumphal procession. The world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. Hallelujah. He always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. God wants you to smell like Jesus to everyone you meet. God wants you to smell like Jesus to everyone you meet. Now the thing about that is, for some people, they're going to be happy. They're going to be glad because they're thirsting inside for the reality of what you've got. But other people who have turned away from God and have turned in rebellion towards God are going to feel like you stink because you serve Jesus Christ and the living God. You are the smell of death to them. And if you ever wonder why you're doing your best to serve the Lord, you're doing your best to be a witness, and some people just reject you no matter how kind and good you are to them, it's because you stink. And I'm not talking about body odor. I'm talking about you stink because the aroma of Jesus is coming off of you and they can't stand that smell. To one, we are the smell of life. Those are the ones who are hungry. To the other, we're the smell of death. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. On the contrary, we speak in Christ before God with sincerity, like men sent from God. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. You see, now he's starting to contrast the covenant with Moses with the new covenant of God. That's why he makes that reference to stone tablets. You see, when God made the covenant with Moses, Moses went up on the mountainside and he received the law of God on stone tablets. Remember, he brought them down. But in the New Covenant, God doesn't write his law on stone tablets. He writes it on human hearts. He says, you are a result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours before Christ through God. Not that we are competent in ourselves, to claim anything for ourselves. Whenever God anoints me to preach the word, I can't take credit for it. 
It's not my holiness. It's not my righteousness. It's not my worthiness. It's not my brains. It's not anything except him, Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God. Not that we're competent to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant. Now note this, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Now I'm going to tread into some deep water here in the next couple minutes. Please follow me closely. This is a very important point for you to get tonight. The covenant that God made with Moses and the children of Israel was a covenant of letters. It was a covenant that was written in letters on stone tablets. It was a covenant that was external to them. The law and the things that Moses and the prophets wrote down in the Old Testament were outside of them. They had to go somewhere outside of them to find those things and to hear them. It was a covenant of letters. It was a covenant of stone. But the covenant that God made for us with his son Jesus Christ is not a covenant of letters. It's not a covenant of stone. It is a covenant of the Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit and the infilling of the Holy Spirit and having the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and leading you and guiding you every day of your life is such a precious gift from God. The old covenant was a covenant of letters. The new covenant is a covenant of the Spirit. The Spirit leads you. And he writes God's law on your heart, on the inside of you. It's not something outside of there you got to go get it or you got to ascend to heaven to get it or you got to descend to the depths to get it. It's near you. It's in your heart. The word of faith that we are confessing that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's not what you get out of a book. That's what you get out of an encounter with the living God. Pastor was right on the nose these last several weeks or months when he said we're moving into an encounter with God because that's what it's all about. It's coming in here and meeting with the Lord and what God can do in the heart of the person who will come and submit themselves to the Spirit, to the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Oh, Lord Jesus. Ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit. The new covenant of Jesus Christ is a covenant of the Spirit. Say that with me. The new covenant of Jesus Christ is a covenant of the Spirit. Oh, don't belittle the Holy Spirit, my friend. Remember here, I'm not talking about tongues. I'm not talking about any of those things. I'm talking about the divine person of the Holy Spirit who come down from heaven, sent by Jesus to be another comforter to abide with us forever. The covenant of the Spirit. Hallelujah. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The letter kills. What was he talking about, the letter kills? He's talking about that old covenant of Moses that came on stone tablets. Only thing it could do was kill you. That's why they had to have the sacrifices. That's why they had to have the temple system. That's why they had to have the priests. That's why they had to have the high priest, because you couldn't just come to God any old time you please. It needed Jesus to offer himself unblemished to God, your behalf, so that you might have access to the Father. And he says here in verse 7, if this ministry that brought death which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory. The ministry that brought death. Moses' ministry brought death. That's what he just said. 
Moses' ministry brought death. But why? So that we might have life and life more abundantly in Jesus Christ our Lord. Hallelujah. That ministry brought death. It was engraved in letters on stone, but it came with glory. It came with glory. How did it come with glory? If you go back and read in Exodus, you'll read how the, the mountain was filled with smoke and there was thunder and peals of lightning and there was a trumpet blast that grew louder and louder and louder. And the people were instructed not to come near the mountain, not to touch the mountain, that if any animal, one of their herd, one of their sheep, one of their goats, one of their cattle, touched the edge of the mountain, they were to stone it to death or shoot it with arrows. They weren't allowed to approach that mountain where God was. But still, there is that glory on top of that mountain. And it says, if that ministry that brought death came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, fading though it was, will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? Oh, hallelujah. We have a covenant that brings life instead of death. We have a relationship with God that enables us to be indwelt by the very God we serve in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives in us, not on the basis of our worthiness, not on the basis of our works, but on the basis of Christ's blood and the basis of our faith and asking him to fill us. He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Oh, Jesus, thank you tonight. The ministry that condemns men is glorious. How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? Did you hear that? Moses' ministry brought death. The ministry of the Holy Spirit brings righteousness. Do you need righteousness in your life? Go to the Holy Spirit. Go to the Holy Spirit. Come before the Lord. Say, Lord, I need righteousness in my life. I look into the law of Moses, I see death. But if I look into Jesus' face, if I look into the face of the Spirit, I see righteousness. I see life. Oh, the Holy Spirit brings righteousness. See, righteousness isn't something you can achieve on your own. That's why the old ministry brought death. You can't achieve right. That's why, why God gave it. It was, hey, guys, listen to you people. Come on, stupid. <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't do it. Your, your works are like filthy rags. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. It's not going to be acceptable in my sight. But the Holy Spirit brings righteousness to you. And if you fail, if you fall, if you slip, if you, if what we'll call backslide, as long as you will call upon his name and you will repent and you will come to the Lord and you'll say, Lord, forgive me, Lord, cleanse me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, set me free and give me the power to overcome this thing that's attacking me in my life spiritually. He will hear your prayer. He will answer your prayer. He will cleanse you from your sin and he will fill you with his presence and his holy anointing and he will give you the power to overcome anything, any obstacle that keeps you from being everything God wants you to be. That's the ministry that brings life. That's the ministry that brings righteousness. For what was glorious, talking about Moses now, has no glory now in comparison. Now there is a glory with Moses' ministry. Even now there's a glory still associated with that. But in comparison to the ministry of the Spirit, compared to that it has no glory. That's like talking about the sun. The pastor was talking about the sun this morning and how the sun is this thermonuclear reactor. And the ministry, the glory of, of Moses' ministry is like a 100-watt light bulb. Now, you put a 100-watt light bulb in a room, it can pretty well light up a room, depending on the size of the room. But if you have an average size room, a 100-watt light bulb will do a pretty good job. I always want to put two or three of them in there because I like bright stuff. But uh, that little 100-watt light bulb 
stand it beside the sun. And that little hundred light bulb has no glory in comparison with the sun. The glory of the old covenant has no glory now in comparison with the new covenant of the Spirit. Oh, they both have light, but the light of the Spirit is greater. For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if it what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. And that means the glory can shine on through. (laughs) Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Now the Lord is the Spirit. Now you see... How could he say that? Because he understood the nature of the Trinity. He understood the nature of the Godhood. He understood that there isn't a division between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that they're three, but they're one. They're three in one. So he could say the Lord is the Spirit. There's some people that say, well, you know what? You Pentecostals, you just put too much emphasis on the Holy Spirit. You just talk too much about the Holy Spirit because Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is the one that died for our sins. Jesus is the one that's coming back to take us to heaven. And you shouldn't be talking about the Holy Spirit so much. You should be talking about Jesus, not talking about the Holy Spirit. Ah, but friend, the Lord is the Spirit. Hallelujah. When I talk about the Holy Spirit, I'm talking about Jesus, my Lord, because there's no division in the Godhead. There's no division in the Trinity, but they are one for all and all for one. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now listen to this. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom. Freedom doesn't come from political parties. Freedom doesn't come from man-made organizations. Freedom doesn't come from human governments. Freedom doesn't come from revolutions. Freedom comes from the Lord. Freedom comes from the Holy Spirit, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God tonight. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God tonight. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness. You see, that's why God doesn't give up on you. That's why God doesn't give up on me. That's why God doesn't give you one chance and then just throw you out because he's in the process of transforming you. He knew how you were when he saved you. He knew what he had to work with when he first started out. If he wasn't intending to do something more with you than what he's already done, he'd have left you the way you were to begin with. You're not hopeless. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. How does that ever-increasing glory happen? Well, what happens is you start out at one point, you get saved, then you get filled with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit starts transforming you. And as he begins to work on you, 
He starts with a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time, and he gets some main things, primary things worked out in your life, and then he brings in some bigger guns. He brings in some more power. He brings in more responsibility. He brings in more accountability. He brings in greater vision. He brings in greater anointing. And that glory that began as a small speck of light in the midst of all the darkness of where you were expands and grows and pushes the darkness out of your life until everything within you is filled with the light of the glory of his presence. Ever-increasing glory that comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. <laughs> 